Alrighty. Well, we're going to be doing reversing heart disease today. Um, so let me start with a prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, we pray you be with us as we look at heart disease, how to prevent it, and in many cases reverse it. We ask your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, how many know somebody with heart disease or have had a heart attack? Anybody? Yeah. It's... Uh, Heart disease and cancer are the two big killers in America. Okay, well our story actually starts in Chicago during the Depression with a Jewish boy. Got his start in photography business and he was a problem solver. He would take orders at weddings for pictures and then he would go home and develop them, come back. By that time they'd changed their minds. So the solution? Next time he went to the wedding, he took the pictures, took the orders, and developed them in the back of his station wagon and sold them to him before they could change their minds. And that fixed the problem. Business grew. <coughs> he hires untrained help. How do you get the lighting and focus just right? He developed an autofocus, auto lighting technique that even untrained people could use. During World War II, the government had trouble making the fine reticules for this Norton bomb site would go on the bombers. It was a piece of glass with lines etched thousandths of an inch apart. If there was any vibration in the building, it threw it off and they'd have to throw it away. Um, they would only make a few a day. So they gave him the challenge. How do you make this? So what he did is he painted stripes on the wall, took a picture of the stripes, developed the pictures, projected the pictures onto a piece of glass which had photoresist on it, took the picture on the glass, developed the picture on the glass, then he dipped it in hydrofluoric acid and etched the lines into the glass and was making hundreds a day with unparalleled accuracy. Um, by the way, these had gyroscopes. My father loved gyroscopes. And after he passed away, there were, we found four or five of them in the basement. So if you would like one, please see me after the talk. <laughs> we'll get you one. Here it is on the B-17, the Flying Fortress. They actually had it under lock and key. The military police would come out, yep. stall it. When it came back from a mission, they would lock it up again. So who was he? And how did he discover how to reverse coronary artery disease? Because he was not a doctor, but he battled incredible odds to convince an unbelieving medical world that you could reverse coronary artery disease. Was it Ornish? We're, we're going to get oh, there. Okay, okay. okay, stay tuned. We'll look at the rest of the story shortly. Mm. So, am I having a heart attack? First of all, what is a heart attack? Well, your heart actually is a muscle with arteries, and uh, these arteries supply the muscle. You think, well, if all that blood is in the center of the heart, how could it ever have a deficiency? But it does. It needs to pump them out the aorta, and the very first stop of the blood is the coronary arteries. Um, if, if you get plaque on these arteries from the American lifestyle, the plaque is throughout the arteries. If one of those plaques ruptures, say down here, the body thinks, the blood thinks it's a severed artery. So it forms a blood clot, and if the blood clot forms here, this part of the heart dies. That's a small heart attack. Your body's, the rest of the heart can take over the work of the, of the uh, function of the heart. And you'll form scar tissue here. This will be dead muscle, but it'll be scar tissue. And you'll survive. If you get it up higher, you lose a larger portion of the heart. The rest of the heart may take over the function of the body, uh, but you may be a cardiac cripple. You may not be able to do as much work as you could before. If it's up higher, you lose an even larger portion of the, body, of the heart, and the rest of the heart cannot take over the function of the heart, and you die. That's a lethal heart attack. Um, now, please note, plaque anywhere in the, in the heart can rupture and cause a heart attack. The artery does not have to be narrowed to cause a heart attack. And that's why 50% of people that die of heart attacks, their very first symptom was a lethal heart attack. Because you don't get symptoms from plaque. You get symptoms when there's narrowing. But you don't need narrowing to rupture a plaque. Alrighty, so 
What does it feel like? Feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. I thought I was going to die. Does everyone get chest pain? No. 12% have little or no pain. Is the pain in my chest from my heart? Well, it could be costochondritis. It's an inflammation of the cartilage in your chest. It can be from pericarditis, pleuritis. That's the sac around the heart and the lungs. Um, but the pain from a heart attack is usually a squeezing pain just to the left of the sternum. It can radiate to the jaw. One fellow went to the dentist, said, I've got a toothache. Can you fill the cavity? And he said, your teeth are fine. He sent him to the ER and he was having a heart attack. Good if, call on the dentist. It's a what? Good You'd call, call on the ER. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that was. <laughs> um, now, he may have been having other symptoms besides just the pain in the tooth, which mm -hmm. could have tipped him off. Now, if that's a heart attack, what is angina? Now, on the American diet, again, plaque can form in those arteries, and it can cause narrowing of the artery. So, as you're sitting at rest, your heart doesn't have to work very hard. The blood supply it gets from that narrowed artery can be sufficient. But if you try climbing stairs, your heart has to work harder. It needs more blood. It can't get it. And so it sends pain signals to your brain saying, sit down, rest. Um, angina is generally less intense than a heart attack. It is, again, squeezing or pressure. It can be brought on with exercise. We call it exertional chest pain. It comes on with exertion. It can be relieved with rest or you take nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin dilates arteries and that can take the chest pain away. The rule of thumb is if you've got heart disease and you have nitroglycerin, if you take nitroglycerin every five minutes for chest pain and if after three pills it does not go away, go to the ER, you may be having a heart attack. Is a prior heart attack or just angina, is that dangerous? Does that put you at risk for Sure. Um, disease? Yes. Uh, if you've had a heart attack, risk of dying is 5% after the first year. And if you have angina, it's 4% per year thereafter. How do I know if I have heart disease? Well, there's a good chance you do if you have risk factors for it. Um, risk factors, cholesterol, hypertension, obesity, smoking habit. Probably the biggest risk factor you have is living in America on the American lifestyle. <laughs> the sad diet. Yeah. <laughs> so, to test for heart disease, one of the first tests is the treadmill stress test. Patient gets on a treadmill, walks very slowly, and every five minutes, or three minutes, excuse me, it goes faster and faster and faster until the heart is pumping at maybe 80, 85% of its maximum per heart rate. The EKGs, are looking for ischemia, where your heart's not getting enough blood supply, and there'll be changes. It'll be ST depression or flip T waves or something of this nature to indicate that you've got, you're not getting enough blood supply to the heart. Now, again, it starts off slow and goes faster and faster. Uh, we had a patient who related that she went to the cardiologist, and he uh, did a treadmill stress test for her, and it started off slow, and she was walking on, and she says, I walk faster than this at home during my exercise. And he smiled at her and he said, the treadmill will win. <laughs> so, um, now the problem with the treadmill stress tests is they're not real sensitive or accurate. They're 65% sensitive and specific. That means if three people have heart disease and you test them, it'll only pick up two of them. It'll miss one. If three people do not have heart disease, it'll tell you one of them does. That's 65% sensitive and specific. Furthermore, when they screened, you know, since heart disease is so prevalent, when they screened a large body of people to see if screening would decrease death rate, did not change death rate. Because, remember, to have a heart attack, you don't need narrowing of the arteries. This is only going to pick up if you have narrowing. It's not going to pick it up if you just have plaque with no narrowing. And that's, that's the problem. Well, what comes after treadmill? If we feel you have heart disease, regardless of what the treadmill shows, 
the next step would be uh, a radionuclide scan. That works a similar way. You get on a treadmill, you walk, 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 and then you get to peak heart rate. They inject a dye. The dye is carried by your arteries to your heart. And everywhere where there's a good blood supply to the heart, the dye is absorbed by the heart muscle. But if there's an area that's not getting a good blood supply, it won't get the dye. And when you do a scan, a scan, um, you get a hole in the heart. This is a scan. You would have one of the, where there's red, that shows the dye. If there's a portion of the heart which is not getting, is not red or does not light up, that's an area of ischemia. Either you had fibrous tissue, you had a heart attack there, or it's uh, So if it's you have it around the whole thing, that's good. Yeah, that's good. If there's an area where it's not lighting up, the dye is not getting there for some reason. Either it's scar tissue or it's a narrowed artery. How do you tell the difference? They may wait a couple hours and see if it fills in. If it fills in, then that's a narrowed artery. If it doesn't fill in, that's probably scar tissue. Yeah, all right. Now, this is a, a less expensive way to check for a cardiac function, but it's, it's dependent on the operator of the ultrasound. It's called a cardiac ultrasound, cardiac echo. Um, and uh, you bounce sound waves off the heart. And wherever you have a change in sonographic density, you get an interface, you get a partial reflection of the wave. And so it can show boundaries of different tissues. And this is your heart. They do it here. This is the bottom. This is of the bottom of your heart. And it's looking up. And here's your left atria, your left ventricle, and you can actually see the heart pumping in real time on the screen. And so they, same thing, walk, 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 fast, 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 lay down real quick, do a cardiac echo, and if a portion of the heart is not expanding the way it should as the muscle contracts, or if it's, the wall's not moving in like it should, that area is either had a heart attack or it could be ischemia, not getting enough blood supply. Um, and so that's, uh, that's significant. The other interesting thing you can do is you can actually measure or get an, actually an approximation of your heart strength. That's called the ejection fraction. A normal heart, each contraction will eject 50% or more of the blood with each pump. At rest, it might be 50% if you start climbing a mountain. It'll go to 60%, 70%. And then when you stop and you rest, it drops back to 50%. If it goes from 50 to 70, that's a 20% increase. That's called a 20% cardiac reserve. It's what you would say as your heart's functioning well. Heart patients may only have 0.9% ejection fraction reserve. It means that their heart is very weak. It's just barely keeping them alive. So heart strength can be determined with an echo. What comes next? If you're strongly positive, then the next test would be a coronary angiogram. This is where they, you just lie down on a table, they put a catheter in your artery, sometimes the legs, sometimes the arm, goes up to the aorta, and they, they feed it through the aorta, well, into, actually before the aortic valve, they, they feed it into the uh, arteries the coronary arteries, they inject a dye, and if the dye is, see here it's narrowed, that means there's plaque there narrowing it. And they say, yeah, this is significant lesion, here's another lesion, and then they've diagnosed not just coronary artery disease, but exactly where the narrowing is. Um, this procedure is uh, in preparation for a bypass or an angioplasty. When do you need an angiogram? That's if pain is unacceptable despite medical treatment or a lifestyle treatment, or tests indicate that a large amount of heart would be lost if a heart attack should occur. occur. It's, again, in preparation for bypass or angioplasty. Now, angiography is not without risks. These include bleeding, stroke, heart attack, death, serious complications, um, what's your chance of finding something significant on the angiogram? It depends how old you are or how long you've been exposed to the American diet. 
age 28, 22 percent, but it increases by age 70, it's over 90 percent chance of finding something significant in, uh, if you've grown up in America. Once it's diagnosed, what's the surgical treatment? Well, coronary artery bypass is one treatment. Um, if you have narrowing here in this artery, they can take a vein from your leg, sew it in up here, and bypass the narrowing and sew it in down here, and you've now bypassed the narrowing. That's called a bypass surgery. Um, these are from veins. They tend to be weaker than arteries. They will tend to uh, re-clot sooner or re-stenose sooner. So sometimes they'll use an artery. This is the internal mammary artery. And if the, bi if the blockage is here, they'll bypass it and put it in here. Arteries are stronger. They tend to last longer. But they are still, they can get atherosclerosis as well. What are the risks of bypass surgery? Well, if you're elderly, 5% patients can die on the table. There's a risk. If you're relatively young and otherwise healthy, only 2% risk of death, or less than 2% actually. Complications from bypass surgery, um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, Reoperations, infections, blood clots of the lungs, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, lung failure, gastrointestinal bleeding, psychotic reactions, death. Uh, but interestingly enough, studies show that nearly 100% of patients who are placed on the heart-lung machine suffer some sort of brain injury. This injury is manifested by minor degrees of intellectual impairment, memory loss, sleep disturbance, personality change, often noticed by relatives. The patient may not notice the personality changes, but the, the you know, family members say, yeah, he's different. They notice that. Um, the patient may be unaware of the personality changes, but family member notices. Yeah. So Are th after the surgery. After the surgery, we believe it's maybe related. They don't quite know why, but it may be related to the heart-lung machine, mm -hmm. something in that. Are cardiac bypass benefits lasting? Well, look at the complications that can occur after bypass. One-fourth of patients with bypass are remitted to the hospital within six months. Sixty percent of remissions are for chest pains and heart-related <coughs> events. Two to six percent are readmitted for repeat surgery. Bypass vein graft closure rates are high. In other words, the vein can clot off too, or can narrow. Two weeks, 10% are closed. One year, 20% are closed. A third closed, another third are narrowed. When is a cardiac bypass recommended? Um, there's only two cases where the American Heart Association recommends bypass in terms of it being ethical. Uh, in other words, you can ethically justify recommending bypass if it could do something, if it could extend the patient's life. So if a bypass cannot be shown to extend a patient's life, it should not be recommended by this criteria. The second one is if the bypass could be recommended if, it, if they have uh, severe disabling chest pain that cannot be controlled with medications or lifestyle alone. Now, as we proceed, just a clue on this. Um, Orney showed in the 80s that chest pains can drop by 90% in 24 days on a vegetarian diet. Wow. Yeah, so unless they've done medications or lifestyle approach first, then you shouldn't be recommending this based on chest pain symptoms, ethically speaking. So, does cardiac bypass prolong or extend life? Um, well, here are three studies in 1984 which measured uh, the survival rates of patients either getting bypass or not getting bypass. So, what they did is if you have coronary artery disease, you come to the doctor for this study, they flip a coin. Heads, you get surgery. Tails, you get medications alone. And they randomized them. And then they watch and see how long, you know, they, at the end of five years, they count them up. Who's still alive? And what is the survival rate in each group? In the veteran study, surgical uh, survival rate was 82%. Medical is 80%. There was no statistically significant 
difference. In the European study, they did reach statistical significance, but it was only 8%. And this narrowed after five years. They got closer together. And the CAS study, again, no statistically significant difference. So um, now this is for patients who had normal left ventricular function. Okay, we'll, we'll get to, there are a few cases where bypass will prolong life, and we want to look at those. This is uh, the VA coronary artery bypass surgery cooperative study group. They looked beyond five years out to 22 years. These are survival rates in red for medicine and in blue for bypass surgery, and they're very close. When does bypass prolong life? Well, there are cases where it does prolong life. If the ejection fraction is 35 to 50 percent, remember the ejection fraction, the amount of blood ejected with each contraction, 50 percent or more is normal. If it's below that, then bypass can prolong your life because the narrowing is not just causing pain, it's decreasing the function of the heart and bypass can restore function and that can prolong life. Uh, number two, if the left main coronary, if this is narrowed or this is narrowed, um, bypass can prolong life because a heart attack here or here can affect the whole left ventricle and to be lethal, be a lethal heart attack. And, but again, the risk is also related to ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is weak, the risk increases dramatically. And again, triple vessel disease, if you have severe chest pain, which is um, limiting your exercise capability, it's one, two, three uh, narrowings. If it's uh, exercise limiting because of pain, bypass can prolong life again. Um, but the majority of patients that get bypass don't meet any of these criteria. Okay, so that's bypass surgery. That's pretty invasive. You have to, you know, put a person under anesthesia, crack the chest, stop the heart, do the bypass, restart the heart, close the chest. It's it's major job. Are there simpler approaches? And that's where angioplasty comes in. This is where you just take a, a catheter, pass it into the heart, into the narrowed area with a balloon on it, blow up the balloon, deflate the balloon, pull it out, and you've mashed the cholesterol against the walls of the artery. And that can leave the artery open and get rid of the chest pain because now instead of a narrowing, you've got an opening. Or you don't eat a triple bypass Big Mac and french fries every day. <laughs> yeah. That's another approach, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so does angioplasty prolong life? No. Angioplasty does not prevent heart attacks or prolong life. It can be used to take away chest pain when medications fail or patients don't want to try lifestyle approach. There is a 1% risk of death. There's a 5% chance of heart attack on the table when you get one. I was uh, following a cardiologist, wonderful guy, seeing many patients. This is during residency. And we would see one angioplasty after another. And I counted them up. I read the statistic, 5% risk of heart attack. That's one out of 20. So we kept a record of how many of these we saw. I said, oh, I've seen 19. And after this statistic, I said, oh, we're due for a heart attack. <laughs> I was joking to myself. And he had a heart attack on the table. And they wheeled him across the hall for emergency bypass surgery. Now, I should qualify this. Bypass surgery in an emergency does save lives. So, uh, you know, there are appropriate uses of it. Angioplasty in a heart attack situation can also save lives. So I'm not talking about emergency, I'm talking about prevention of a heart attack. Um, stenting. So they said, okay, if this doesn't prevent heart attacks or prolong life, let's modify it. When we go in and blow up the balloon, we're going to leave a, a, a tube there, a metal tube, in place to prevent cholesterol from plaque from developing there um, and hopefully prolong life, prevent heart attacks. Have those been shown to be helpful 
in terms of heart attacks and survival? No. 2003, 2004, first generation, well, excuse me, the first ones were in 2005, the first study, found no improvement. Then uh, in 2003, 2004, they started studying the drug eluding stents. They said, okay, we're going to put a stent in and it's going to elude a drug which prevents cholesterol plaque from developing there. Those also did not prevent heart attacks or prolong life. 2008, second generation drug eluding stents also did not prevent heart attacks or prolong life. Now, the question is now, oh, come on, you know, if, I, if I've got a stent in there and it's not allowing plaque to grow there, why wouldn't that prevent a heart attack or prolong life? Well, the problem is when, <laughs> if you've got narrowing in an area, it means the plaque there is thick enough to cause narrowing. But the rest of the heart also has plaque, it's just not thick enough to cause narrowing. What causes a heart attack is a ruptured plaque. So when I put in a stent, I'm only taking care of maybe an inch or half an inch or an inch of artery. Have I done anything to prevent the plaque from rupturing anywhere else? No. So you'd almost have to put a stent like six or seven of them. Everywhere, yeah. Um, uh, now, this is theory. Uh, what is actual clinical trial shown? In 1988, Dr. Little actually studied patients who had had previous angiogram prior to a heart attack. And he looked at people who had just had a heart attack. And he looked at the ones who had previously had an angiogram the previous year or so. And then he, they did an angiogram after the heart attack to find out where the heart attack occurred. 98% excuse me, 97%. 97% of the heart attacks occurred in areas that were previously shown to be open, that were less than 70% closed. In other words, you have to, to merit an angioplasty, you have to have an artery 70% closed or more. So these are areas that would not have qualified for angioplasty or bypass, but that's where the heart attack occurred in 97% of the cases. So that, that just continued the lifestyle, the lifestyle that, that uh, that's right. caused that, it in the first place. So, so even if I could get a stent that would absolutely 100% guarantee I would never get a heart attack in this area, I've only treated 3% of the possible heart attacks. 97% of the heart attacks that are going to happen, happen in the rest of the arteries somewhere else. Does that make sense? Okay. That's, that's the problem. Sad. So, are there alternatives to surgery? Well, yeah, let's look at lifestyle and uh, medications. She also warned against meat consumption, flesh consumption. This is remarkable as this was in an area when meat was thought to be necessary for physical strength and endurance. This is what she said. Their meat is poison and has produced apoplexy, that's a hemorrhagic stroke, and sudden death. Things that cause sudden death most common causes heart attacks and strokes. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> we know this today as far back as 1950, but she was giving this in the 1800s. So, um, when did we learn these things? Well, 1779, Caleb Perry discovered that anginous pectoris, <coughs> that's chest pain, was caused by narrowing of the coronary arteries. Okay, that's good. 1910, Windau showed that cholesterol plaque contains six times more cholesterol than the wall of the artery, saying, okay, what's causing this narrowing? It's cholesterol in the arteries. 1940s, found out how cholesterol is made in the body, it's made in the liver, and the production of cholesterol is stimulated by a high fat diet. In the 1945 to 1955, discovered that cholesterol in the blood was a major cause of coronary heart disease. So we didn't know this till again, 1945, 1955. Now, is there evidence that atherosclerosis is reversible? Well, yeah. The first hints that we have that it was reversible uh, came in Germany. Tragically, the, uh, the Jews in Germany 
were very wealthy, had a very rich lifestyle, and had a high rate of atherosclerosis. When they were put in concentration camps and starved to death, autopsy showed their arteries were clean. It had reversed. It did show it was reversible. Um, after World War II, there was malnutrition because all the farmers were out fighting a war. And malnutrition would cause wasting disease, you know, starvation, and in those patients, arteries had cleaned up. They were clear. And uh, Willens, he has studied wasting disease in the elderly. When the elderly get old, they stop eating, they start wasting away. Atherosclerosis can reverse as well. Arteries open. Are there any prospective studies regression of atherosclerosis? Well, the first ones were done with monkeys. Monkeys normally eat fruit and monkey chow granolas. Um, but then they added uh, cholesterol to the, their normal food, cholesterol and oil. Fat now comprised 50% of their calories. Um, and the cholesterol was equivalent to that found in the diet of most humans in industrialized nations. Within 18 months, the coronary arteries were on the average of 58% closed. They got coronary artery disease on this diet. Then they took them off the oil and cholesterol, put them back just on their fruit and their grains, and in 40 months, their arteries had cleared to where there was only 17% closure. It was reversing. So the bottom line is, if we don't put it in, we don't have to worry about it clogging our body. That's true. Or if it's already there, it can it. be reversed. It can go away. One of the first prospective studies on humans to show regression was done in 1974. Um, they didn't have drugs to lower cholesterol back then. They lowered the cholesterol with ileal bypass. This is what's used for morbid obesity instead of the food going through 30 feet of intestines, small intestines to absorb nutrients, they bypass it and only goes through about 8 feet maybe. So they get essentially an enforced starvation. Um, and serial angiograms showed arteries showed 13% had definite regression of the atherosclerosis. Now the problem with ileal bypass, I knew five obese patients that got it for obesity and four had life-threatening illnesses. One, I mean, they almost died. One did very well. <laughs> but there are complications because you're not getting the nutrients. So I don't, I don't recommend it to anybody. But you heard the uh, weight control talk. And we have alternatives that are very simple that can help achieve, that can cause weight Instead loss. Of restricting it here, let's restrict it here. Yeah, and yeah. It's that's the elbow true. problem. Yeah, that's right. That's true. Okay, so then 1975 drugs came out. Chlorforbrate is a fibric acid derivative, and it's in the class of drugs called fibrates. Um, uh, Blankenhorn in 1975 noted some degree of regression after one year using sequential coronary angiograms. Several other studies were then done confirming the drug's ability to produce some regression of coronary artery disease. Um, Cholestopol came out in uh, 1987 and uh, ni in niacin they were used together to show 16% overall improvement in coronary status using before and after angiograms. Um, if you have a genetic defect, high cholesterols, this is probably the best approach, um, cholesterol with, with niacin. Um, inositol hexaniacinate is, is probably the safest form of niacin, lowest risk of inflammation from that. Um, However, oh, okay. Today, most drugs, the most used drugs to lower cholesterol are either from the statins drug class. Those are, um, you'll, you recognize the trade names, or fibric acid derivatives. Um, these have been shown to be carcinogenic in animal studies. Uh, so let's look at the statin drugs. 
Uh, in a 24-month carcinogenicity study in rats, there was a positive dose response relationship for hepatocellular carcinogenicity at males at drug doses two to seven times that of human exposure. Um, in other words, if you just take the human dose and double it, it caused liver cancer in the male rats. So uh, it's a very low multiple of the human dose that caused cancer in rats. That's concerning. Um, the article asks, this is an article from JAMA, how did it happen that cholesterol-lowering drugs were approved by the FDA for long-term use in spite of their animal carcinogenicity? To address the question, we obtained the minutes from the Endologic, Endocrinologic and Metabolic Drugs Advisory Committee meetings at which uh, the statin and fibric acid derivative drugs were, you, were looked at. The only reported discussion of animal carcinogenicity studies at the FDA Advisory Committee meetings on the statin drug was by the makers of that statin drug who downplayed the importance of these studies. Yep. And that's, you can get the reference yep. here. Money. Um, yeah. The uh, bottom line, it's always money. The fibric acid derivative drugs, um, the minutes from the FDA meeting on gemfibrozole, uh, Dr. Tron, Truendell, the Deputy Director, Division of Metabolic and Endocrine Drug Products of the FDA, noted that this drug belongs to a class of drugs that has been shown to increase total mortality. It's been shown to have animal carcinogenicity, and she doesn't believe that the FDA has ever approved a drug for long-term prophylactic use that was carcinogenic at such low multiples of the human dose as, as this um, fibric acid derivative. What they do is when they're evaluating a drug, they have three, they have subgroups, maybe nine people, look at the drug and then vote whether it should be accepted or not. They bring their report back to the main committee. The subgroup on this, stat, this uh, fibric acid derivative said three out of nine said it should be passed. Six out of nine said no, it's too dangerous. The main body, when it was presented, ignored it and passed it. Um, so, uh, is there a lifestyle approach to coronary artery disease? And uh, do you remember uh, the man we talked about, the photographer, mm -hmm. worked on the Norton bomb site? Um, uh, who was he? Who was Athen Nathan Pritikin? Has anyone ever heard of him? Oh, yeah. Oh, he worked on the bomb site? He worked on the Norton bomb site. Wow. Yeah, Nathan Pritikin. Um, if you've heard of him, then I know how old you are. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> he's a long time ago. Um, he wasn't a doctor. How did he get involved with heart disease research? Well, he, in 1955, he had a treadmill stress test. It showed 2 millimeter ST depression in leads 2 AVF. 2, AVF, and V5, on the lateral side, his left ventricle was ischemic, indicated the heart muscle was not getting enough blood through the coronary arteries. He was diagnosed with severe coronary artery disease. His cholesterol was 280. Average in America is around 200, he was 280. At that time, they couldn't give him much hope, said get your affairs in order, you could have a heart attack any time. Wow. He started poring over the medical literature. And he saw what we read here, 1940s and 50s, they discovered that cholesterol in the blood was a major risk factor for heart disease. So he thought, I bet I can get my cholesterol level down. How can I do it? Well, I think I can do it with diet. So from 1964 to 1966, he experimented with his diet. He tried one diet, and every two weeks he would get another cholesterol level. Every two weeks, every two weeks, he would try one diet after another. Finally, he found the diet that lowered his cholesterol the most. And what do you think that was? Plant-based. Yeah. Eliminate the meat, the dairy, and the oils. This is something in our church we don't emphasize a lot, but it is crucial. Um, and now we have other health reformers also advocating it. And in the diabetic talk, in the hypertension talk, we talk about the dangers of oil. 
Um, yeah, a high complex carbohydrate diet, low in fat, low in cholesterol, worked best, and he stuck with it. In 1966, he, had a, he wanted to do a treadmill stress test again. Cardiologist said, get out of my office, you're wasting my time. Yeah, but, you know, heart disease doesn't go away, we know you have it. And, but he insisted, and he did the treadmill, I couldn't find any heart disease. He was convinced it was reversible. So, and by 1984, by the way, his cholesterol had dropped from 280 to 94. Dramatic drop. But he was really strict. He was, yes. After his normal treadmill stress test, he believed heart disease was reversible with a plant-based diet. Now he needed to convince the medical community with a controlled trial. 1975, he took VA patients, kept them in a rented house. Meals were mainly plant-based and served by his son. The men complained at first. This is rabbit food. Why are we eating this? But they stopped complaining about two or three weeks because their leg pain was going away, their chest pain was going away, their endurance was increasing. Um, and uh, VA was going to do the before and after angiograms for these men uh, that had heart disease. Uh, they kind of backed out on it, but Loma Linda University down the street, run by Seventh-day Adventists, and who have been advocating a plant-based diet for many years, said, we'll do the test. We're anxious to show the benefits of a plant-based diet. They did before and after angiograms, showed opening of the arteries, statistically significant. He wanted to publish it. No one would publish it. The medical community was not ready to hear what he had to say, and he wasn't a doctor. They refused to publish it. Undaunted. He went around the medical community. He opened up his longevity center in Long Beach, California. Patients would come from all over the United States. And, uh, you know, they would be treated on this plant-based diet. Now, has anyone heard of 60 Minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, they, rever they investigate, Everything. you know, quackery, charlatans. They investigate fraud. And they said we got to investigate this guy. He's taking people's money, thousands of dollars, and feeding them rabbit food. we got to expose him. So they went down. They heard his studies. They heard the science behind it in his lectures. Talked to the patients. Patients said, yeah, my chest pain is going away. And uh, they said, hmm, maybe we better take a different approach. So they sponsored three heart patients to go through Pritikin's program. Saw a cardiologist first, who said, yeah, they've got severe heart disease. They went through the program, followed them through the program, and uh, they did well, saw what they were eating. They came back, saw the cardiologist. He said, yeah, they've improved dramatically. And uh, this aired on 60 Minutes nationwide television, and the next day, phone lines to Long Beach were jammed. <laughs> People could not get in fast enough. Um, Movie stars would come. Barbara Streisand, a movie star, came. Lauren Green from Bonanza came. And it's, they, they told him, oh, look, there's Barbara Streisand, and there's Lauren Green. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. Who are they? <laughs> he, had, he didn't have time for TV or movies. He was busy working on his program. Yeah. How did the Is medical community respond? Alive? What? Is he still alive? No. We're going to find out what happened. The medical community respond. Did they say, good job, needs more investigation? No. One year later, the medical community published an article saying, anyone would feel good if you gave them a two-week vacation, but it won't last. 60 Minutes saw the article and said, it won't last. Let's find out. So they went and they found the three patients that had gone through a year earlier. They interviewed them. The cardiologist saw them and said, they're still doing great. They're still on the program. This aired on national television, and the next day, phone lines to Long Beach were jammed again. My concern is between the first TV program and the second TV program, a year apart, how come phone lines weren't jammed? We forget so quickly. Why aren't they jammed today? Because it works just as well today as it did back then. Back then. Finally, they asked him to speak at a medical convention on some side issue. He accepted, but instead of talking on the side issue, he gave them the evidence for reversal of coronary artery disease with a plant-based diet. 
Any questions? Dead silence. He thought, oh, they've rejected it again. So he was a little bit discouraged, but he went out after all the speakers presented. They have breakout sessions in the different classrooms where you can go and ask questions. Well, apparently they gave him the wrong room because the room he went to, packed with people, he couldn't get in. He, said, he went to the manager and he said, where's my room? He says, that's your room. <laughs> and when he got there, he found that they were stunned from what he had said. And for the next couple of hours, they just peppered him with all kinds of questions. They were excited about what he had to say. Age 19, uh, 1985, age 69, Pritikin was diagnosed with terminal malignant lymphoma. Um, autopsy was performed, and uh, they did not tell the pathologist who this was. They wanted an objective report. And after the autopsy, the pathologist said, where did this guy grow up? They said, Southern California. He said, no, 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 where did he really grow up? They said, Southern California. He says, why do you ask? He says, nobody in Southern California has soft, pliable arteries like this. They're like surgical rubber. He says, normally at this age, we cut them with scissors and the arteries shatter from the calcifications on the inside of the arteries. Um, a, an article described his autopsy report appeared in the most prestigious medical journal in the U.S., the New England Journal of Medicine, July 4th, 1985. It documented his severe heart disease diagnosed in 1955. It reviewed his lifestyle change to a low cholesterol, high complex carbohydrate diet. It reviewed the autopsy report which showed his coronary arteries were soft and pliable and widely patent, that is open throughout, um, like a newborn baby's. And this was in a man who 30 years earlier had been diagnosed with severe coronary artery disease. Now, prior to his death, uh, he wrote to Jim Fix. Who is Jim Fix? <laughs> you know Jim Fix, okay. He was a world-class athlete. He had run 20 marathons. He usually logged 60 miles a week. Um, he had run 37,000 miles in his lifetime, one and a half times around the world. He wrote the complete book of running. Um, he believed that as long as you are an active runner, your heart is protected and you don't have to watch what you eat. But after his first edition, he talked to Pritikin, and Pritikin said, no, I'm sorry, you know, athletes have died of heart attacks. you got to watch what you eat. you got to be a plant-based diet. Well, his second book of running, he said, I have talked to Pritikin, and, uh, but he did not change his position. He still believed you could eat whatever you wanted, and as long as you're running, you're burning that stuff out of your arteries. Um, this is what he had achieved. Um, later, he died of a massive heart attack on a four-mile run. Wow. Autopsy showed one artery, coronary artery, 99% narrowing, another 80% narrowed, and a third 70% narrowed. Autopsy showed three heart attacks in the weeks before his death. Now, they knew it was in the weeks before his death because fibrous tissue hadn't yet formed. These were fresh heart attacks, but they found numerous scar tissue from older heart attacks where the fibrous tissue had formed. He was having heart attacks all along. His good physical condition helped him survive the heart attacks until one finally took his life. Okay, so that's the 1985. Finally, Caldwell Esselstyn, a retired surgeon in the 1980s, he was retired. Surgeon, he wondered, what am I going to do with my life? So he started studying heart disease and found plant-based diet could open up arteries. So he talked to the cardiologist. He said, hey, have you got any heart patients that are inoperable? Can you send them my way? And they said, sure. So they sent him heart patients. He put them on this plant-based diet. Before and after angiograms showed opening of the arteries. He published these in peer-reviewed journals, case studies. These are not controlled trials. These are case studies. And... Uh, um, Peer-reviewed journals published him. Finally, 1990, you mentioned Dean Ornish. Mm -hmm. Dean Ornish essentially repeated <laughs> Pritikin's pro study, 1975 study. Um, it was published because he was a doctor and times had changed. And it demonstrated regression of the coronary arteries in before and after angiograms. He'd have patients come to him, put them on a 
vegan diet, and the before and after angiogram showed opening of the arteries. Statistically significant uh, results, it shook the medical community. Now, prior to Pritikin's death, he was asked to speak at Loma Linda University and Medical School, run by the Seventh-day Adventists, the ones who had done the before and after angiograms. And he said, you know, I've read those books by Ellen White. He says, you have a gold mine of information in those books, but you're just sitting on it. He says, you've got to get out and share it with the world, which is what he was doing. And it's probably where he got a lot of his ideas. Okay, that's heart attacks. We're going to close with the angina. Is angina reversible? Now, angina is not a heart attack. It's just decreased blood supply to the heart. And it'll come on with exertion. How long does it take to relieve this? Actually, 24 days. Doesn't take a year. And you think, no, wait a minute. If it takes a year to open up the arteries, why does the chest pain go away in 24 days? Um, um, because in 24 days, he found that um, cardiac patients on a vegan diet had increased endurance of 44%, just 24 days. Angina episodes decreased by 91%, 24 days on a vegan diet. Ejection fraction reserve, remember? At rest, 50%. When you exercise, it goes up to 70%. Heart patients had only 0.9% cardiac reserve, but at the end of the program, 24 days, it had increased to 5.8. It was getting better. Regional wall motion improved. Blood pressures dropped. Um, how long does it take? Two to three weeks. Endurance increases one to two weeks. Ornish, an interview with him, says they not only feel better, in most cases they are better in ways that can be measured. Myocardial perfusion improves in only a few weeks, as documented by exercise thallium scintigraphy, radionuclide ventriculography, and cardiac positron emission tomographic PET scans. As a result, patients reported a 91% reduction in their frequency of angina pectoris within only a few weeks. Patients sometimes say, I like eating meat, but not that much. Even sexual potency often improves via the same mechanism by which Viagra works, such as nitric oxide. This is the key. This is why it opens up in 24 days. Because in that time, insulin resistance is resolved. And remember, insulin stimulates nitric oxide release by the endothelial cells in the arteries, which dilates arteries. So when you get rid of insulin resistance, which happens in a few days, the arteries start opening up, and that's what relieves the chest pain, sexual impotence, which is common in insulin resistance, is also relieved. We had a patient, massively obese patient, come and uh, to our lifestyle program in the evenings. He, he had coronary artery disease. Literally, he could not walk 10 seconds on the treadmill before he'd get short of breath, chest pain. Um, within a week, he was walking up and down the halls, and he says, my erectile dysfunction has disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it, it, just like he says, it, it is reversible. Um, <coughs> uh, so here it is. Let me, here's an interview.